Northern Gothenburg is unique. Here, the local communities extend out into the countryside in huge areas of untouched natural resources. There are also amazing initiatives and untapped competencies which represent great potential for the city's sustainable development. With the project, Urban Rural Gothenburg, we want to take advantage of the unique potential of this area. We want to create a foundation for green business development and make it easier for local people to realise ideas, services and products that contribute to a more sustainable local community. Jag har och min bror det här bisambelle och runt om oss ska allt ska blomma runt om oss och bina är viktiga utan bina kommer vi inte överleva och därför vi kämpar för det. With increased cooperation between residents and companies, associations, administration and researchers, we can find new ways to develop a more sustainable city together, valuable for everyone. Man måste börja med sig själv först. Hur man tänker, hur man vill leva, sen man kan hjälpa andra. That is why we are establishing meeting places to increase cooperation between city and countryside. Everyone is welcome to help with the development of local communities in Northern Gothenburg. With the aid of the collaborations at the meeting places, applied research and our five different test beds, we work to build new knowledge within sustainable transport, food, tourism, recycling and more. For example, we support the testing of electric powered logistics and distribution in order to develop links between the city and countryside. We are also investigating how to obtain more accessible and low-carbon RECO rings in the city. At the same time, we're working for organic and locally produced food for Gothenburg's public catering, such as preschools and retirement homes. Ska man sätta en avtryck på den här jorden så tycker jag nu att jag kan stå för det här. Odla grönsaker. The city centre is approaching the countryside. And in this city close countryside lies the potential that strengthens our ability to transform into a carbon free city while contributing to a sustainable urban development built on local growth, innovation, employment and equality with better living standards for everyone. Pense em um sonho, daquele que você gostaria muito que se realizasse. Agora imagine se isso fosse possível, hoje. E que o segredo para que esse sonho se realize seja... Pessoas. Pessoas empenhadas e unidas em torno de um propósito. Esse é o Grupo Águia, o mais diversificado e completo grupo de turismo do Brasil e também o mais apaixonado pelo que faz. Afinal, viajar, conhecer novas culturas e lugares é fazer acontecer dentro de nossos clientes a possibilidade de alcançar não só distâncias, mas os seus corações. Porque quando olhamos para o céu, vemos mais que possibilidades, vemos um universo de caminhos. Caminhos que às vezes escolhemos para ir ao encontro de grandes desafios. Como integrar paixão e excelência em uma só experiência. 
e juntos vencer dificuldades e gerir competências para realizar melhor sonhos como este que você acabou de imaginar. Porque é olhando para os céus que sentimos vontade de voar cada vez mais alto, de começar e recomeçar sempre, seja na sua cidade favorita ou em um novo lugar. Afinal, o desconhecido é para nós uma forma de energia, porque é nele que aprendemos e crescemos. Por isso, somos diversificados. É do ser humano ser assim. É humano ter coragem e garra. Conhecemos, incentivamos e valorizamos em cada uma das pessoas que trabalham conosco essa força, essa alegria fortalecendo o nosso conceito de grupo, compartilhando ideias, conhecimentos e realizações. Para que o nosso maior sucesso seja alcançarmos o nosso maior propósito, a felicidade. Grupo Águia. Dê asas aos seus sonhos. Boa tarde de novo. Um prazer muito. Good afternoon once more. It is a pleasure to be back here with all of you. This has been an intense day in terms of content, but very rich content, and I hope it can bear great fruits. I'm sure we will see great fruits coming from this, from all of us, not only in our professional activities, not only as players in the tourism industry and the event industry, but also in our personal lives. Now we have a, a panel that is entirely female to discuss a topic that is in the agenda every time we discuss sustainability, the issue of circular economy. We have seen in the previous panels how much knowing about the topic, being informed, having education on all topics involving the issue of sustainability, how important it all is. Therefore, we thought it would be very relevant to have as a specific topic the discussion on circular economy and how circular economy can be a virtuous system for tourism and events. Here with us today we have some amazing people, as we had all day long. and. We have a panel with very powerful women from this area. So first, I'd like to introduce all of them. Leia Judger, is, who's here with us, is... Let's have everybody on screen so everybody can see them. So Leia is an uh, architect and uh, urban planner. She has a master's degree in urban uh, environmental management in, from the Netherlands. In cradle, specializing in cradle to cradle and built environments. She's currently studying for her doctorate's degree in the architecture program in Unicamp. She received a highly commended award from the jury of uh, the Circular 2019 for the leadership category in the World Economic Forum and the Global Forum of Young Leaders. She's also part of the leadership group for uh, circular economy for the SOLVE program at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She's passionate about creating healthy products and spaces, and she has been applying to her work tools for research and design aimed at promoting a beneficial impact for users and the environment. Together with her work at Circular Idea, she founded Flock, a consulting and design company that uses circular ideas and cradle-to-cradle -cradle on architecture, urban planning, and industrial products. She has also been teaching in workshops, lectures, and courses, thinking about the C2C design in diverse scales, from 
products to architecture and cities. So we have an expert from the from academia to share with all of us the concepts of circular economy. Here with us we have Katarina Thornstenson. She's an experienced strategist in sustainability, a consultant and moderator with a deep interest in sustainable growth in destinations and in building bridges to reach results. She has many years of experience in leading and developing the sustainability work in the tourism industry in Gothenburg in Switzerland, in Sweden. Uh, as a result, Gothenburg has been elected for four times the world's most sustainable city. It was not, uh, appointed as the world leader by the Sustainability Index for, for Global Destination in 2016-2018. She also led the, uh, the running for the, for the European Capital of Intelligent Tourism for 2020. She has a bachelor's degree and was a sustainability lead and senior consultant in several meetings and events, such as the World Congress of Associations, Euro Skills, European Championships of Indoor Athletism, and so on. She's the president of the uh, Swedish Network for Sustainable Tourism, and she's a frequent uh, lecturer at the University of Gothenburg in, in international symposia. It's great to have you here with us today, Catherine. Then we have Carol Urci. She's a tourism expert with a degree from the Federal University of Mato Grosso do Sul with a master's in administration from the same university. She has been working in tourism for 15 years with an experience in hotel management and tourism management in the event management area, commercial sector and revenue management in the hotel segment, as well as the ma uh, management of tourist enterprises. She is also a researcher in academia who's here to tell us about her work and how she applies everything from her studies, everything she got from sustainability and tourism and events and share it with us. Carol also worked as a researcher and a technician in ecotourism and sustainable tourism planning, together with nature conservation, preservation, and biodiversity. And she also develops touristic product, uh, projects for public use and nature conservation in private public partnerships and in the third sector. She has worked as the commercial manager for hotels in the city of João Pessoa, and she's currently the revenue manager of a hotel in the capital of Paraíba and another hotel by the same group in Juazeiro do Norte. It's great to have someone from the Brazilian Northeast who can bring this opportunity to learn of what she, tell us what she learned in university and share her work and research. Finally, and but not least, we have Maria Aparecida and Beatriz Aparecida. They live in Sierra, uh, right next to the seaside, and they will be able to tell us about Tucum Network. Maria Aparecida de Alcantara is a popular educator. She's specialized in psychopedagogy, and she's the president of the Caixara Association for Human, uh, Human Production. And she's an activist in the defense of the seaside region in Sierra. And she's the executive secretary for Tukun Network. Beatrice is also here with us. We don't have her image right now, but we'll have her back soon. She has a degree in public administration. She's a young activist from the seaside uh, area in Sierra and also coordinator of the Tukun Network. The great thing about this panel is that not only we have two researchers who can tell us about circular economy, who can tell us about how tourism can come into this process in circular economy, but we'll also have two points of view coming from practical experiences in two completely different worlds. We will have Gothenburg with Katarina, and we will have Aparecida and Beatriz telling us from their experience 
how things work at Tucum Network in Ceará, which is an example today of community tourism, solidary economy, and sustainability governance within Brazil. I now will pass the floor to Catarina. We will have an introductory round so everyone can share their words. And then we will go to the second round. If you have any questions, please send them through the chat, interact. This is a unique opportunity we have to be in contact with these amazing women. Thank you very much, Catarina. Thank you very much and good evening, everyone. And thank you for inviting me to this forum. Uh, I will try to share my screen here uh, and hopefully I will find my presentation. Uh, did not. A minute, no, that was not the one. Okay. Now, do you see my, oh yes, you see my screen, thank you. Uh, so my name is Katerina and I represent the city of Gothenburg and I work at the Destination Management Organization, which is the city's, a city-owned company. And our mission is to, to get more people to discover and choose Gothenburg. And we do this through wide-reaching collaboration. And today, today I will go through our journey uh, where we started many, many years ago and where we are today and what we have in mind in the near future. But first of all, I, I'm sure, I don't think that every one of you have visited us yet. So this is about where I am right now, uh, five hours from you guys uh, in uh, Sao Paulo and Brazil. And the city of Gothenburg is situated on the west coast, uh, close to the, the sea. And uh, we have about 1.1 million residents in the metropolitan area of Gothenburg and about 600,000 people living within the city center. Uh, so that's shortly uh, some facts about Gothenburg. Uh, and we're not green in only one sense uh, we have uh, it's a very green city we have pocket parks and uh, bigger parks and wilderness uh, close by within the city center uh, and also a tram ride away we have a, a wide archipelago uh, so we have nature close by even though we're an urban destination um, as carla introduced us uh, we have become number one on the Global Destination Sustainability Index four years in a row. And of course, we're really, really proud of this, but also really humble uh, because we know that uh, everyone has their challenges and the context is, is really different. Uh, we're a fairly small urban destination in a global perspective, like compared to Sao Paulo, we're, we're really, really tiny. So. We're really, really humble about, about this uh, prize that we have won. Um, 2018, uh, politicians and our uh, hospitality in industry uh, made a bold statement together that by 2030, we will have grown uh, in, in double by being and challenging accepted ideas of sustainability. But to understand where we are now, we have to go back uh, a couple of years in history, and that's where I'm, I'm going now. So in the mid 80s, uh, the environmental minister of Sweden named Gothenburg courtyard to hell uh, of a reason. This was due to heavy, heavy pollution. Uh, but this was also the start of a transformation of the city, a transformation that was based on public and private collaboration. But as when it all, always starts, it starts within the environmental department in the city, not within tourism. We, to get it into tourism, we have to move a couple of years forward in time. Uh, around the millennium, I would say that uh, 
sustainability was sort of sneaking into the tourism and events industry in Gothenburg. Uh, this is a picture from the inauguration of the European Championships in Athletics. And this was before we had the, the word social sustainability on the radar. And what we made possible was the inauguration of the event in the city center open to everyone to the public without being and it wasn't necessary for the public to buy a ticket for example this was the first time that the inauguration was outside the official arena so this is one way we have worked on uh, getting uh, the whole uh, whole city to get a piece of the action from from that, uh, we have used meetings and events as key tools to move forward and uh, accelerate the development of of sustainability within the destination. And and up for for now, we have a really wide events portfolio portfolio, which we still use as tools to to move forward. But to get the whole picture, again, I move back a couple of years in time from now. Uh, about 2010, uh, we saw, we had a gut feeling that something was happening uh, when it came to, to meetings and events as well, that they, the rights owners were asking for sustainable destinations. So we made a benchmark and a thorough benchmark on city infrastructure and as well uh, the meetings industry infrastructure. And what we found was that we had a great potential. We weren't on the map in the first benchmark, but we saw that we could be on the map. So after that, uh, we invited suppliers politicians, civil servants round the table and introduced our findings to, to them and sort of challenged them and asked, how about this vision? We want to be a global leading destination for sustainable meetings and events within a couple of years. Are you with us? <laughs> uh, and actually, they were with us so this was really a, a collaborative decision uh, and now 10 years later maybe i was naive but i i see that the suppliers were really really bold at this point in time uh, so this was sort of the way forward collaboration was really key and all through the journey we have used what was the seed of this uh, Global Destination Sustainability Index uh, as a tool, an important tool, but because what this index stress is exactly, it's about collaboration. It's about what the city does, what the suppliers does, and also what the destination uh, organization does. So this has been a, a really important tool for us to, to develop and be more systematic and more professional. So. As for today, uh, public transport is as good as fossil free and the vehicles are as good as um, accessible for everyone. Uh, and just to point out that we are not only working on, on environmental sustainability. An example is that a couple of years ago, we had the Europe Pride in, in Gothenburg and the public transport system, they striped their trams in, in pride colors. Uh, we have used a certification strategy uh, in, in collaboration with the hotels and venues, uh, and this has worked out really, really well. As for today, 95% of the, the rooms are, are certified with an environmental certification and also the main venues. Uh, again, using meetings and events, and we want to be a destination that is inclusive uh, and welcoming for, for all. Uh, but most important, we, we use events as test beds. And this is a really, really good example where, where we can see actual uh, the circular economy coming into practice. Because 
this is circular economy is a is a systems thing that you have to you have to collaborate around it you can't do it on your own and at this event we are we are testing methods like um, a refund system for for cutlery and for for takeaway uh, stuff uh, and tr what is working and what is not working and then we hope to sort of uh, expand the system to be something that is working in the city every day. Uh, so this is a way for us to use events as test beds. And we are really, really in the, uh, uh, how do you say it, in the cradle when it comes to circular economy, I would say. We are trying things and testing things. And just as when sustainability was really uh, starting the transformation in the city it was within the public administration and the ngos where things were happening and i can see the same thing in gothenburg for today uh, and i hope that we could really integrate it in a much uh, wider way in the tourism and events industry because our the hospitality industry is really uh, uh, showcase and, uh, and display window for, for these uh, initiatives. Um, so that was really, really short, our, our journey, <laughs> speed, speed presentation. Uh, and also on that, uh, uh, we were uh, appointed European Capital of Smart Tourism, was, which is a really, really interesting concept where we have both sustainability, but also connected to culture and as well to digitalization. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. So welcome to Gothenburg any day. Que incrível, né? Uh, thank you so much, Catalina. It was a wonderful presentation. Uh, eu passo a palavra agora uh, para a Leia. I pass the floor to Leah so that Leah can uh, follow through addressing the uh, concept of circular economy and her work. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Katharina. It was an incredible experience. So good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank Carla for the invitation. I'm quite happy to be here with you, even happier to be in this round table with women only, incredible women with sensational projects. So thank you all for the invitation. I'm quite flattered. And I'm going to share my screen with you. I have prepared the presentation as well. Well, uh, can you see? Or do you have the many slides? Is it right for you? She's asking. But anyhow, I'll be speaking about circular economy, about the concept and the cradle to cradle, which is the concept within the circular economy that I work with. As Carla was saying, I am an architect. So I am not from the tourism and hospitality sector. I'm here just to add efforts uh, with our knowledge. But I really work with design. So in order to develop circular economy by means of design, the design of products, and also the design of architecture and cities, the urban design as well. So speaking about circular economy, and I always go back in time to really tell you what linear economy is, that is from cradle um, to the grave. So we extract the resources, we consume the products, and then we dispose of them. That's a linear, so that's a straight line. So in terms of the extraction of resources, we have the depletion of resources. So we are extracting all of the resources, uh, turning them scarce. So this leads to the depletion of important elements that we use in our day-to-day. -day. 
On the other hand, we have the disposal, the disposal of materials. This generates pollution, which is quite visible. Uh, we are bothered by such pollution, as you can see in the landfill here. So we've been polluting our oceans, the air, the soil. So we have different kinds of uh, contamination as a consequence of the linear economy. And finally, I'll be speaking about toxicity, which is less visible. We don't see that quite well because we don't actually know what things are made of. So I always joke around and say that when we buy a tomato in the uh, supermarket, we know that the uh, tomato comes with other elements, elements that we are not you know, willing to consume. The uh, fertilizers, the pesticides, they're all there. Sometimes we know when eventually we buy, there are no other choices, right? Likewise, the same happens to things. We don't know what these uh, things are made of. We don't know exactly whether this uh, paint of this T-shirt was made to be in touch with my skin. Likewise with the shoes. And this has to do with toxicity. Things can emit toxins. And then there comes the idea of sustainability, a quite strong idea that was planted in the 90s. And it was really based on efficiency, right? High efficiency, impact reduction, damage reduction, uh, environmental uh, compensation. And this idea of efficiency linked to sustainability has to do with zeroing. We want to zero the impacts. We want to have zero waste. And in my opinion, it is as if we were going towards an abyss and then we kind of step on the brake. We're going slowly, actually, but we are not shifting the paradigm when we lower the speed or just minimize something, minimize an issue. So in this book, Cradle to Cradle, it has really changed my angle on the world. It was written in 2002 by an American architect. He's a chemist, uh, Professor Michael Brondat, a person with I work in Brazil. So the environmental economic issue should not be underpinned by the waste management or by minimizing the damage only. More important than that is actually working with the design. So we have to design our things, thinking about what's going to happen afterwards in the next cycle for that product, for that building, for water, for any kind of resource. So that's why it's cradle to cradle in Portuguese. Well, it means cradle to cradle in English, anyhow. So we always wonder what's the next cradle and then what happens after? And then there is this idea of effectiveness. Efficiency has zero as a target. The ob objective of effectiveness is more. The more positive the impact, the better. So let's try and look into nature to really understand how nature works and translate that into our industrial systems. And then they said, nature is not efficient. If you look into a tree, if you analyze a tree, it produces many things, oxygen, it creates the habitat, fruit, and then fruit falls and ants eat. We see it beneath the, the tree. We use the, the shade of the tree. That is, it produces much more than what it needs for its survival and its reproduction. So it's not efficient. It's effective, actually. So from understanding nature, they use uh, three fundamental principles for cradle to cradle. The first of which is that a waste is a nutrient when they are designed for that purpose. They can actually recirculate indefinitely in their systems. The second principle is that we have to use the unlimited solar input. The renewable sources, they're out there, they're free, they're constant, and we have to use them as much as possible. And the final principle is that we have to celebrate diversity. This is quite interesting, in my opinion, especially here in Latin America, so that we can understand how we can translate 
such concepts and bring it to our context, which is more complex. We have diversity, the biodiversity, the diversity of cultures as well, or the diversity of solutions for an issue, for a problem. So they go beyond this holistic scenario after understanding nature, and then you decide to discuss the application. In this case, there are two steps. First, we have to know what things are made of. So we look at the molecules. We check what the materials are, what they're made of, uh, who are the suppliers, and what we see in the uh, materials. And then little by little, we replace what we are not familiar with, things that you think are not acceptable, if, if it's mutagenic, for example, and then you replace by you what you want. So it's intentionally done. You have to do it intentionally. And then in the second step, we may understand that we are within two cycles. We have the biological cycle, the biosphere, and then we're going to be discussing everything that comes from the earth and goes back to earth. So we have here consumption products, shampoo. We wash our hair, for example, with the shampoo. The shampoo goes back into the drain. So it goes into the waterway system. So shampoo has to be designed to go back into the water system again. And then in the other cycle, in the other sphere, we'll be talking about the technical uh, products and the technical cycle. And then we have the non-renewable materials like metals and plastic. And if they are designed for that purpose, they can also recirculate in a healthy way. E aí aqui eu falei um pouquinho, né? Eu, eu, a, eu, a gente quando pensa em economia circular, a gente pode trabalhar. When we talk about circular economy, we can work in several scales. I talked about the molecular scale and a wider scale. We will think about industrial products. Then we get to buildings, communities, or even cities. Lastly, we will talk about a circular economy between countries, between um, throughout the, the planet. So I brought a few examples so we can discuss them. So my first example is Alca Embalagens, a packaging company. It's a Brazilian company. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It produces uh, the these dishes from yuca plant. They can be used for composting. You can even eat the, the little plate after you use it. This is a very interesting project. They just got their first award in a challenge called Rethinking Plastics, which was organized by MIT and the Inter-American Development Bank. They are from Patagonia. They have an issue with the, uh, with the maritime ropes and the pollution caused by them. So they get them from, from the the sea, they are made of nylon, which is a type of plastic, they refine it and they make containers. It makes the plastic go back to the industrial cycle. So here we are talking about upcycle, you are improving the quality of the materials. This is my my project from my, my company, the Circular Home. This is a prototype, we've thought about it for a long, long time. And we were trying to find a different way to inhabit the planet, more closely connected to nature, to the systems around us. So we understood that the home is a bank of materials. We understand that each material has its value. We know everything that we put into the home, what is, what is the cycle it's participating in, if it's the technical or biological cycle, and what are the possibilities in terms of what will happen with each material that we've included in the home? What might happen later on? So we created a modular architecture. It's made of parts that fit together, so we do not use glue or cement. Everything is screwed together so that the house can be readapted and redirected to new uses. We also talk about talk about the energy cycle, so how we can use uh, natural lighting and uh, cooling, so to 
pr provide comfort through the project. We also talk about how to close the cycle of water, so we we capture the water before it goes back into the system. And we also worked with the idea of the relationship between users and their surroundings, so that we can support local biodiversity. Here's the, the final result of the, the house. Very briefly, I'd like to discuss a couple of other perspectives that could be interesting for the tourist tourism point of view. Thinking about water, not only the thinking about treating water, but how can we provide more benefit? So this integrated biosystems. This is a system that uh, treats dark waters with a series of tanks with algae and fish and plants so wastewater is filtered through it and as a result in not only have clean water the system generates biogas which can be supplied for cooking or in natural fertilizers for agriculture so it supports biodiversity and help for the local population so this system is widely used here in Brazil. There's a very interesting project in Petropolis from the uh, from an environmental institute in, in Haiti and also in China. It's a very interesting project. Finally, I'd like to discuss the production of food. This is something we have been discussing extensively here in Brazil, the issue of what are we using in our food and how our health suffers an interference from this type of uh, linear production. So I have the the farm from Brazil, a project by Ernest Gott. In, and it's a beautiful project because it has the production of food, but at the same time, it provides regeneration for the area. Something that is amazing. The farm is called uh, Water Ice because with the regeneration, the water that was there, lots of springs that had dried up, are once again providing water. So this is really related to regeneration. So to wrap it up, circular economy is a way to understand that nature is not only a source of materials for us to extract, but it can also be a very interesting source of learning and inspiration. We need to create ways to grow that work side by side with nature, not against it. Nature is not linear. It is circular, it is regenerative, and it's abundant. And I believe that if we do our homework, our future can be as well. So. That was my message. Thank you very much. I love that final sentence. Waste is a design mistake. That is wonderful. We all say, oh, but I recycle. And there's that, that, that idea that recycling is the last case scenario because we need to do everything we can before it to avoid producing waste. This was great, very beautiful, very clarifying. Thank you, Leia. Because that moves towards the direction we will move with the forum tomorrow and in the next few days, in the next panels, where we will also be able to bring this perspective of tourism going beyond sustainability. Tourism as an element for regeneration. Now, uh, we'll pass the floor to Carol so she can tell us a little bit um, of her understanding and her opinions in how she sees cooperation and so on in the front lines, in hotel management, and how she sees it from the point of view of academia. So the floor is yours, Carol. Carol, I don't think you have unmuted yourself. Pronto, agora sim. Boa noite a todos. 
Boa noite, porque aqui Good no evening, Nordeste everyone. já está escuro. Good evening, it's é, queria agradecer a oportunidade, assim, ao convite thank da you Carla de estar aqui junto a essas mulheres realmente inspiradoras aí, poder compor esse time feminino, né? Muito obrigada por ter aceito o convite. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this feminine team. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this feminine team. Eu tinha uma fala preparada, eu não vou fazer a apresentação. Eu tinha uma fala preparada, mas eu gostei tanto da fala da Léa e ela casa tão bem que eu vou começar um pouquinho diferente, né? que eu ia falar e depois eu vou dar continuidade rapidamente. Uh, é muito interessante a forma que a Leia apresentou a proposta da economia circular e o que me veio à cabeça relacionado ao meu tema de estudo na academia, que é a ética da sustentabilidade. Né? Eu tive a oportunidade de, desde os 17 anos, trabalhar em empresas que tinham políticas ambientais e políticas de sustentabilidade, então, é, só podia me tornar uma profissional voltada a esse tipo de ética, né? Eu acho que é quase que inevitável. E uma das coisas que eu observo é mais ou menos isso. É, é, todos que estão aqui presentes, muitos que estão assistindo a gente aqui, nós temos a nossa ética construída sobre o viés da sustentabilidade. É isso que move o nosso, nosso trabalho e as nossas ações. Us, né? é, dentro da, do estudo da administração, eu estudava a ação racional do sujeito para entender o comportamento organizacional. E eu cheguei na ética, porque, pela minha experiência profissional, eu fiz estudos dentro da faculdade, né? depois do mestrado, tinham algumas coisas que me incomodavam. Né? E eu ficava sempre inquieta, porque é, eu via muito, todo mundo falando a mesma coisa, os mesmos sonhos, e, e a gente sempre esbarrava, sempre tinha uns entraves. Né? Então, várias maneiras da gente fazer a mesma coisa. E eu comecei a estudar isso profundamente, obviamente, tive que entrar lá nas bases filosóficas até chegar na, na, nas organizações, mas eu comecei a entender que é uma forma ética da gente trabalhar. Eu gosto muito de que hoje eu trabalho dentro de uma empresa que tem uma política é, sustentável no próprio nome, né, Verde Green, o nosso outro hotel em Juazeiro do Norte, que é o IUA. É, a gente é certificado pela ISO 14001 de gestão ambiental, estou lutando para que a gente consiga a certificação do, do, do Garrido, que estava no painel anterior, que é da sustentabilidade de bens de hospedagem. E eu percebo que ela é de forma estrutural que ela precisa acontecer. Né? A ética da sustentabilidade, ela estrutura qualquer tipo de ação, em qualquer tipo de empresa, em qualquer tipo de cliente, em qualquer tipo de gestor. Né? A partir do momento que esse gestor, esse tomador de decisão, ele está estruturado, uma ética sobre o viés da sustentabilidade, a economia circular, a economia verde, a quebra desse paradigma, ele acontece. Então, voltando à minha fala, é, eu queria trazer uma análise um pouco desse sistema econômico do cenário micro, né? Então, por muito tempo, dentro das organizações, é, a gente apresentava um modelo de sustentabilidade que, em inglês, é o triple bottom line, né? Que é o tripé da sustentabilidade. Mas na prática, né, ela exige diversas outras esferas. Né? A sustentabilidade, ela não é um tripé, ela é raiz. Né? Ela é estrutural. Uh, tem um acre pé de sustentabilidade que minimize os impactos do modelo organizacional tradicional. A gente precisa realmente quebrar esse paradigma, paradigma porque justamente ele é linear. Então, pensar a organização de maneira a valorizar as relações econômicas circulares, ela está diretamente relacionada com o conceito de sustentabilidade. Né? E, e é dessa maneira que a gente consegue potencializar os impactos positivos do turismo, enquanto atividade econômica, mas principalmente enquanto fenômeno social. Certo? É, claro que quando a gente fala de sustentabilidade, eu já disse isso em outras falas minhas, a gente precisa desmistificar e eu acho que resgatar o verdadeiro conceito e ir para a ideia de utopia, concept, né? que os sujeitos utópicos na antiguidade eles eram considerados os maiores antiquity. pensadores, os We're formadores de opiniões, né? responsáveis aí por diversas transformações sociais ao longo dos anos. E, e com o tempo, esse significado ele foi mudando. Né? Até no dicionário, utopia, descrição, 
the é, de praxe, da utopia, é, é qualquer descrição de uma sociedade ideal, fundamentada em leis justas, instituições político-econômicas verdadeiramente comprometidas com a, a, a coletividade e o bem-estar social. Né? Eu não consigo pensar isso como uma utopia no sentido... É, no sentido construído, né? que é aquela coisa fantasiosa, irrealizável, porque não é, é algo possível. Então é importante a gente desmistificar. Na verdade, esse conceito de fantasioso ele foi criado com o próprio modelo instituído. Era importante que essa sociedade que pensa na coletividade fosse destruída, né? é, para que um, esse modelo tradicional que a gente vive hoje fosse instaurado, né? que é um modelo que a acaba, infelizmente, valorizando aí, é, o oportunismo em prol de relações unicamente lucrativas. Uh, e que acaba tendo que negar a coletividade para que esse oportunismo prevaleça. Né? Mas eu acho que a questão chave é, que a sustentabilidade dentro das organizações ela precisa ser enxergada como um elemento estrutural. Né? Ela precisa ser uma, uma política, ela é a base dessa pirâmide. Uh, seja da alta gerência, seja dos colaboradores de base, quando você estrutura e trabalha dentro das suas relações éticas, dos efeitos dentro de uma empresa, das organizações, instituições, enfim, ela é, ele é multiplicador. Né? Eu, eu observo isso na empresa que eu estou hoje, nas outras empresas que a gente trabalhou. É a ética que orienta o pensamento racional do sujeito. Né? E ele pode ser orientado para o utilitarismo, né? criando ações voltadas para os processos de cálculo, os fins focados exclusivamente no resultado final, ou ele pode ser focado de, de formas substantivas, né? que são relacionadas a, a formas de autonomia, Uh, de julgamento ético, de emancipação, uh, que são, são diretamente relacionadas ao desenvolvimento humano. Muito parecido com o que a, a Lea falou de, 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 é, da relação humana, a relação nossa com as coisas, a forma como a gente entende, da questões de entendimento das coisas. Né? Então, quando você... É, e é a sustentabilidade, essa so forma ética, que ela acaba por equilibrar esse pensamento racional da organização, mas ela não deixa de lado o objetivo fim dela, que é o lucro. Né? Na verdade, ela transforma a ideia do lucro a qualquer custo e transfere a tomada de decisão considerando os meios. Então, no momento em que a ética da sustentabilidade ela, ela é incorporada né, de maneira estrutural dentro da empresa e da organização, a gente começa a perguntar o porquê e o como a gente vai fazer isso. Né? Não é abrir mão do lucro, é considerar a maneira como o resultado organizacional será alcançado. Uh, como posso atingir o meu resultado, potencializando o impacto positivo na esfera social, promovendo o desenvolvimento local, conservando a natureza, os recursos naturais, né? é valorizar o como farei, e não, não tão somente o que eu ganho com isso. Né? É, até... Puxando a fala da Mônica, no painel anterior, é, quando ela falava sobre a capacidade de carga dos destinos, relacionando isso ao turismo sustentável, né? é, quando a gente dá importância e para para entender a capacidade de carga dos destinos, isso é uma ação ética voltada para a sustentabilidade. Né? Porque a gente está entendendo os limites da atividade, restringindo os seus resultados, aos limites aceitáveis de carga. Né? Hoje a gente está controlando o fluxo e, e, e evitando o impacto negativo da visitação massificada. Um dos exemplos né? é, dentro do turismo. E só para finalizar, é, eu acho que até para a gente promover uma discussão depois dessa fala, que eu acho que o principal entrave é, das organizações em relação à economia circular ou à própria sustentabilidade ou sustentabilidade em si. A, a Lea também comentou isso. A gente não está estruturado para atender de maneira circular. Né? As organizações elas estão numa outra linha de organização. Um exemplo, nós aqui do Hotel Verde Green, Here at the Pessoa, Verde Green Hotel, um, Pessoa. nós temos um comitê verde, de uma maneira committee. muito legal, nós não temos It's um setor de sustentabilidade, tá? nós temos um comitê 
We onde, have a no caso, eu faço parte da coordenação, mas a gente tem uma liderança da, do departamento pessoal, uma liderança do departamento de eventos, a gente está abrindo mais vagas para outras lideranças é, e outros colaboradores de base para participar desse conselho. Então, o comitê que faz a gestão da sustentabilidade no hotel. Né? Então, a gente envolve outros setores e não fica restrito tão somente é, é, ao setor de sustentabilidade dentro da empresa. Como eu disse, é estrutural. Todos os setores têm indicadores de coleta seletiva, indicadores de eficiência energética, enfim, é, 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 alguns exemplos. Óbvio que uns mais, outros menos. A gente só usa produtos biodegradáveis. Outra coisa legal que eu acho que tem muito a ver com isso, João Pessoa não tinha uma, uma um fornecedor que, que nos vendesse produtos biodegradáveis, né? Mas está na nossa política ambiental e até pela nossa certificação de gestão ambiental a exigência disso. Olha que interessante, um dos fornecedores disponíveis, você não, eu vou começar a fornecer produto biodegradável para vocês. Então, porque a gente também dentro da nossa política a gente tem uh, 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 o ideal, e é o que a gente geralmente faz, de comprar somente de fornecedores num raio de 80 quilômetros, justamente para promover o desenvolvimento, né? o desenvolvimento local, regional. Local então, regional a gente não queria comprar esse produto que então, não queria comprar de fora, pelo contrário, a gente queria gerar renda próximo da gente. O fornecedor falou e comprou, e começou a fornecer hoje, ele já consegue distribuir esses produtos biodegradáveis para outros clientes, não só biodegradables, né? E a gente conseguiu, de acordo com a nossa necessidade, multiplicar é, tanto a renda desse fornecedor como a utilização de produtos biodegradáveis por outras pessoas. E eu acho que a economia circular tem um pouco a ver disso, né? E a, a empresa ela precisa estar disposta. Na verdade, ela só vai estar disposta sem achar que isso onera. Without se ela tiver a ética voltada para a sustentabilidade, se ela, se ela entender isso de maneira estrutural. Para finalizar, só um outro exemplo que está acontecendo, close, a gente decidiu, a gente está elaborando um programa em parceria com uma ONG é, ambiental aqui da, da, da cidade, de, city, de compra dos nossos insumos so da economia da agricultura familiar, né? porque a gente compra de intermediários. Isso quando nós compramos para intermediários. So then we decided to buy straight from the farmers. Orgânicos, né? So they work então, with organic products. So essa, uh, essa, let's make it circulate. Né? Let's Vamos make the wheel spin, right? E so let's disseminate the idea. So we can do a dot deadlock because uh, uma the restaurant de alimentos needs a certain diversity of foods. And sometimes the local farmers, they cannot deliver such variety to us. Let me give you an example. I need 50 kilos of potatoes. 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 Não, né? não se adapta ao nosso modelo, que a gente precisa de diversidade, não vou mudar meu menu, não vou mudar meu cardápio, a gente trabalha num restaurante de alta gastronomia, ou a empresa pode falar assim, não, eu vou me adaptar, eu vou comprar da agricultura familiar, né? e eu acho que é essa tomada de decisão que é influenciada por esse tipo de decisão pela ética da sustentabilidade. O verde vinho, ele é um pouco de se adaptar. Então, a gente está criando pratos executivos que vão ser baseados e construídos de acordo com a entrega desse agricultor mensalmente. Né? O agricultor vai falar, olha, posso entregar 50 kg de batata e, e 20 kg de abóbora. Ótimo, nesse mês, a gente vai desenvolver pratos especiais baseados na capacidade de entrega da agricultura familiar. Então, é, trouxe esses exemplos, assim, so acho que dá para passar o tempo para poder exemplificar um pouco essa ideia de como a sustentabilidade, so the idea. o próprio turismo sustentável, ele só vai acontecer quando a gente pensar de maneira estrutural.
structurally né? A gente tem muitos bons exemplos. So a Catarina, we have very good examples. É, é, assim, and é um incrível. It's an incredible é, example in that né? city. It's a wonderful Como city. É possível. On how this o trabalho is que a Leia vem fazendo, so the work that que as Leia meninas has been que vão falar logo depois. And also the girls mas have, that come after me that we're talking about excellent work. Do, é, But these are isolated isoladas, examples. Né? They are isolated anterior, initiatives. O... In the previous panel. Isso, isso foi dito também. Acho que foi até o Alexandre Garrido que comentou. I think it was Alexandre Garrido who said that. Você começa um projeto de turismo sustentável, mas se você sair dali, ele não tem continuidade. Né? Então é por isso que ele precisa estar nas, nas nossas raízes, sustentabilidade é raiz. Não sustainability é is about the roots, tá it's not about tá a tripod. It Acho que essa é a minha mensagem. <laughs> That's my message. Quite a message, huh? Carol. I love the concept of a sustainability as roots and really uh, displacing this tripod and everything that you said about the ethics of sustainability i think that yes it's the only way forward and thank god we do have this way it's a wonderful way for us to follow maria aparecida and beatrice will join us They're going to talk about this practice in Ceará, in the uh, beaches of uh, the northeastern of Brazil, on how the uh, Tucum uh, network was organized, how it works. So Maria Aparecida speaks very well. She's fun and nice to hear. So tell us, explain to everyone what the Tucum network is and how you have emerged, how you organize, and how you are able to put into practice the uh, concepts of the ethics of sustainability, the concepts of cooperation, and how this has been, you know, yielding results to you. Welcome, Maria Aparecida, and welcome, uh, Beatriz. I think there was a connection glitch, but let's follow through with Maria Aparecida. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure, it's a great joy to be part of this panel with wonderful women. It's quite thrilling to listen from you because we see the role of uh, connecting. We see possibilities of doing a different tourism. So I am part of this association that has always discussed sustainable tourism. That is the Caixara Association. And the Tucum Network emerged in 2006 from this uh, community it's uh, a reserve area a green area in the eastern uh, area of Ceará. we are 12 communities operating together in defense of our territory i think that uh, most brazilians know how much the coastline is under threat so our network is a strategy for us to defend our land for us to give due value to our culture, for us to improve the income, even sustainability and the uh, defense of the environment. So this is how we work. We work together to be stronger. So we have communities of fishermen, farmers, we have quilombola, indigenous uh, communities and extraction reserve areas. Right, Bia? I think Bia is back. You may continue. Her internet's not stable. So tell us, continue, go on. So community tourism is the one that addresses the local populations. There is Bia. I think you can hear me, connection is not good, she says. As Aparecida said, so we are organized here in Sara with uh, 12 communities. We have indigenous extraction communities, Quilombola community covering the coastline of the state of Sara in the northeastern of Brazil. With the community tourism, we work with the tourism 
not only to showcase, but we visit the communities and people get fond of the communities. For those um, who have been here, you are familiar with the solitary development and community tourism. So this is how we share our experiences. We share in the network income generation in the communities so we promote income uh, generation within the uh, communities we engage fishermen and the other the other professionals who are part of the uh, communities so we make the income circulate within the communities So we work with the sustainable economic development locally. Apologize, <laughs> no glasses needed. Oh, Beatrice, I'll have to interrupt you because it's very unstable. And I'm getting the messages here. People cannot actually hear you. It's failing. So I apologize for that. So I think Aparecida can carry on, okay? Because because of the internet, yes, you may continue, Aparecida. Okay. Thank you. Apologize for that, Bia. So thank you, Bia. She's a community member from the Canto Verde Beach. So this is how we work with the uh, community tourism. We uh, relate to the place, relate to the identity of the place. Community tourism will promote the equitable distribution of income in the community. So whenever we think about the circular economy, as was mentioned here before by the previous uh, panelists, so this brings balance. This uh, instills ethics in the community. So we have fantastic experiences in our community that is giving due value to our local production. So we do have this option of using the uh, family-based farmers. They have organic farming. We have the organization of the farmers, of the fishermen as well. So we are rescuing our traditions and we are offering the visitors, we are offering the tourists the best that we have. So they may experience uh, the life of our communities. For example, indigenous people, Quilombola people, so it's an alternative way of tourism. So this helps them to be in touch with different realities, with a different culture, and people really fall in love with the best that we have to offer in our communities. We do have some assumptions. So we criticize the uh, capitalistic development model, which sometimes you know, destroys the uh, basis of our communities, unfortunately. So whenever the visitor wants to visit our communities, we ask them about their diet, what they drink, and we offer the best that we have. Instead of uh, offering the soft drinks, we offer the juice to give more value to our production. Our recipes, you know, date from uh, previous generations, our great, great grandparents. So these are dishes that are developed and designed in giving due value to what the community can offer. It's very ecological. It's quite pleasant. So we take into account all of these uh, principles. So we have the community organization. So early on, the local management thought about this uh, new tourism model. So we have our interconnection strategy that is publicizing our experiences in the network. And this happens based on partnerships. We do have some entities that play this role. There is a kind of a press service so that uh, the leadership can be trained on management, on how to give due value and present the culture. So the visitor feels at home it's quite welcoming. It's very cozy indeed. So we have the CGT, that is the working group that, you know, develops the documents, the scripts, everything that happens within the community. 
it's, it's a very positive vibe. We are quite happy to be able to welcome our visitors, the tourists. We have uh, the hostels. It can be a family-based home, for example. There are people who want to visit the families and they do have the option to, of staying in the homes or they can be in a small hotel, in a hut, whatever they want to do. So we have a, a boat travel throughout the communities they're willing to visit. So they can really have a different uh, experience. They can plant seedlings, they can dance with the indigenous people. So this is how we build the scripts, the different options that we have for the visitors. We do have some publications on that that better explain the work that we develop in the community tourism. We do have a catalog that shows, you know, pictures and the history of some of the uh, communities. That is the Tukum Network catalog. You can find it over on the web. So we have a recipe book as well, community recipes. So uh, the communities develop their typical dishes, the ones that are sought after. We also have a handbook with rules and procedures. So those who are willing to do community tourism and they want to be part of the network, they have to abide to such rules and regulations. And of course, we give the value to the uh, craftsmanship, uh, the uh, competitions that we do in the river. We have assemblies and ecological tracks. We have different projects that enable everyone to act locally, to visit locally, the way our women work and behave, the way they think, the way they connect to each other, the way they produce their goods. So this all has to do with local tourism. It's a fantastic experience indeed. And it has been built by many hands. So thank God today, we do have uh, high level partners that have helped us in this construction. So they identified the leaders, people who have stood out, people who have developed themselves. So they have made their communities an international reference. So we have the Institute, the Institute for the Citizens, and it has very nice projects. For example, the ecological work that takes into account the water springs. We do take care of the water sources that we have. We also protect the, the, the swamp area, the maritime life. We give due life to crafts uh, fishing. So these are the strategies that we uh, consider and that we relate to. We are deeply intertwined with a circular economy. We aim at finding partners that truly believe and truly respect our options. So that's our message for everyone that is here with us today. The Tukum Network, it is a process under development, addressing the communities that believe that a different kind of tourism is possible, thinking about improving the quality of life of our families, of our communities, including sustainability of our planet, based on playing experiences, but they're really different, not only in the state of Ceará. This can be done in this entire country or perhaps internationally, as Catarina is here with us. She was talking about her experience. So we were awarded. We were a finalist for the Brazilian Foundation addressing the sustainable technology, and we got other awards. And it's important to highlight them. So this is all based on the partnerships that we have developed. Tomorrow we are going to PC the bagaging project. We are part of the Sun Network, which also has experiences on sustainability and community tourism. So there are many strategies that we have devised in each of the communities and they really stand out. We appreciate the invitation. It's very nice to be able to exchange information. It's very much valuable to us. Congratulations on the event. Thank you, Carla, for the invitation. And we're quite happy to be here. We'll be here to support you or to clarify any matters. We know time is short, uh, but it's worthwhile to check all of the experiences that we have available in our country. This really makes us different. Thank you. 
So Aparecida, it's always nice to hear you speaking. It's always nice. Empowering, as you were saying, the sense of pride, all of that. And precisely teamwork. So you all belong to the Atukum network. It's a very nice way that you use to organize and to conduct the uh, touristic experience. We really notice the massive engagement of the entire community and of the other surrounding communities that are part of the Atukum network. Now I'll turn it over to Leah so that Leah can actually make her final remarks. So Leah, and then I have a question to you as well. Okay, perhaps I'm going to ask this question to you straight on. So that Leah, you can try and answer, please. So Miss Leah, it's a question from Marcos Gonçalves Ramos. Do you believe that the circular economy involves uh, practices of reduction? and working with the scalability processes to make it sustainable? I think that circular economy, in fact, does not say that we have to stop growing or reduce. But maybe you should think about looking at a donut economy by Katie Donut. It's interesting the way she speaks, the way there, there's a TED talk by her. Nature grows. Think about a tree. It grows, 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 and grows. And at a time, it stabilizes. So this constant the willingness to grow the GDP and the analysis of economists is this, well, we have to grow and grow and grow. But we don't always have to grow. If we reach a point where the systems are in fact circular and regenerative, we can get to a stability point to stabilize the economy. The circular economy does not have to say that we have to consume less because if we think on the, the model proposes a way to, if you correctly design it, you are recirculating the materials. So there's no reason for you not to consume. You should be consuming the right things. Of course, it doesn't mean that you're going to waste. You will consume what you need and what you want. But there's no reason for you not to use a lipstick. If the lipstick has been taught out to be used on your skin and go back to the environment. So consumption is not uh, something that is not good. But you need to design good products and good systems so that you can have it. You do not need to take a sh shorter shower if the water is being treated, you need to take a shorter shower. If your water is not being treated, then you will have a scarcity of water. So with a cradle to cradle view, you can actually consume in a positive manner. I just like to add a remark. I think everyone who spoke here talked about the issue of uh, how all discussed it very much about a, a social contract. So we can move from a linear economy to a circular economy. No one can work by themselves. Me and my, at my home, Aparecida Serra, there's no point. We need to be aligned in terms of concepts. And, we, and society as a whole has to buy into this idea. The countries that have a, that this is more advanced, you have an understanding of different factors that compose the economy as a whole. So each doing their role, but aligned to the final goal, to the ethics. I think that's what these ideas brought me. Very good, Leia. Thank you very much. You really gave us a, a class on circular economy in a way that probably no one here will ever forget. And you could contribute immensely to us to everything we've discussed today. Carol, can we hear you? Your final remarks? Right, I'm off course, I'm right here. I'd also like to thank you. I thought all the 
all the talks here, the Tukum Networkers, I, I'm familiar with it. I have talked to them that I presented in a, a workshop about the, the, the network when I was talking about community tourism. I think it's this compliment having us working in a collective way I will add a, an aside here in related to that I'd like to have you think about something I have some criticisms on to on hyperconsumption I do think that we need to learn to consume in a balanced way because even if we understand where products are coming from, how it is being produced, and even if it's being recycled and going back, I think that hyperconsumption is still a divi divider. Hyperconsumption of water will still be limited to a certain group, and this group will consume more water than the other group. So I think that, yes, we do need to have uh, a line of thought in terms of reduction, in terms of sharing, the assets and products on earth I think that this is important and work together I see circular economy green economy and as everybody said this breaking this paradigm I got to to this point to questioning this ethics because I am someone who cannot be quiet a lot of people were discussing this and we had difficulties and we still do it's difficult to say it. okay this is a hundred percent sustainable and I started understanding that the system as a whole of where we are inserted does not allow us to be a hundred percent sustainable and this is not the fault of a group or the economy it needs to be understood as a whole, we need to change our behaviors. Our behaviors when it comes to consumption, when in choosing products, the way we understand things, our relationship with nature as well, with culture, with society, so that we can truly propose changes. And so that the circular economy, for example, can be a virtuous system for tourism and for events. I think that new models, breaking paradigms, this is what really brings out the potential of tourism as an economic activity, as a social phenomenon. And this is the way that it will, in fact, provide social transformation, as we say in theory. So I believe that this paradigm needs to be break broken. Congratulations, MAPS, Carla, and everyone in the organization for your panels. This is a great initiative. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I hope that all of our panels will be spread out and always so that th we will not stop discussing because we have a lot to say. Just a quick comment. It's an invitation. I'd like to take advantage of this space and say that next week on Tuesday and Wednesday, we will have an open class on circular economy. We will have a longer time, we will have an hour where we will be discussing the topic through circular design. So I'd like to invite all of you to go into the website at a Circular Idea and there will be a pop-up for you to choose the best time for you, either uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. Thank you for this beautiful invitation. We will also uh, promote it on our social media so everybody can be aware. Carol, Thank you for your very deep participation. I think this has brought us this very careful outlook when it comes to ethics and sustainability. And I think it's very beautiful the way you say that, show that sustainability has to be at the structure level. It's not something separated, oh, this, the, sustainability department know it's something at the root and there's no question that you being interested by the issue of sustainability and wanting to live by contributing effectively towards the planet and 
all of its inhabitants. This has a major impact in your life, right? This is very beautiful. Now, to close, I have a question for Aparecida from Aline Passos Araújo. She's asking, as an organized community, what do you see as your main challenges and barriers to promote circular economy or a uh, solidarity economy with community tourism? It's a very interesting question because we do not talk so much about our challenges that we see in community tourism that we face on our daily activities. One of our challenges is the structure. I think that they have shown this very clearly. The structure of our communities, the way they are planned, they bring with them these challenges. The Our public policies do not have a environmental bias. They do not think on sustainability in a way where we can have selective recycling, where all communities can use it well. So these are the challenges that we face on, on our routines that prevent us from having a circular economy to have the sustainable development we dream of. So it's quite challenging. I think this is a process that has to be built by many pairs of hands and requires this partnerships and this strength so we can put into practice alternatives, investments, so we can continue to reduce the environmental impacts. what we see in our cities and our communities. So these are challenges that we face. At times we need to go from one community to the other, from one city to the other, to be able to buy products that we cannot find in our communities. But we have been trying to favor this circular economy because we have wonderful products for family agriculture, for sustainable fishing. So we have alternatives, we have ways to make them become a reality in our daily lives. But there are many challenges. But with all of our strengths added up, with all hands on deck, we can overcome it because we believe in those possibilities. Our people is strong, we are warriors, we're fighters, and when we believe in our potential, we can provide great transformations. This was beautiful what you said at the end of fighting resilient people that when you believe in, our, in their potential they can truly cause changes. Your experience at Paris City in Bia is inspiring. I've told you that when the quarantine, when lockdown is over, the first place I'll go is to Ceará to go through the Heiji Tukum network, Tukum network uh, path. Here we will close our panel and uh, leaving several takeaways for reflection. How can we bring sustainability not only to our lives but to our activities in a structural way and an ethical way and how can we establish partnerships, alliances, where cooperation will guide us. And above all, I think that we reinforce with you the idea that this economic model, as Leah explained as well, the linear economy where the main thermometer is GDP growth, it might be pretty much bankrupt. So we can see today that everything that we have on our planet, particularly with ourselves, that we cannot continue this way. We need to reinvent ourselves from the inside out so that each and every one of us can feel 
empowered to transform as an agent in our own destiny and in the destiny of our planet from now on. So thank you, thank you sincerely. Thank you each and every one of you. Katharine had to leave early because we were a bit late. So thank you very much, Katarina. And thank you for your participation. She was enthralled by being able to be with all of us here today, to be able to multiply and take that message forward. Thank you very much. It was an immense pleasure. For those of you who stay, as we do at the end of our panels, we'd like to share with you the way how we're doing in terms of the costs for the event, the amounts we received, how they will be used and so on. So once more we had an event that was motivated by our belief, by our desire to be an agent of transformation. And when we organized the event, we did not want to but charge for the registration. We wanted it to be a donation. So each and every one of you can truly feel uh, involved in the sustainability movement. This is not a MAPS forum. This is a forum from all of us to all of you. And we want to count on your cooperation to see if we can at least uh, seal our get to. We have an open uh, cost sheet, and in any case, we and we're we having the overall cost that were spent. We still consider a donation for the Shikwing Village a community in Xingu who is facing the effects of COVID and from invasions from illegal miners. This donation will happen and we count on you to be able to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you for your participation. It was a wonderful day. I know that we've had some issues with transmission in one of the panels. I'd just like to remind you that everything is being recorded and everything will be made available so that you can listen later and once more thank you i'll see you tomorrow we have another full day with four panels four amazing panels to continue with this debate moving towards to the issue that we have for this major challenge on how tourism can not only be sustainable be responsible but also contribute to regeneration of the planet. Thank you very much. Good evening and see you tomorrow.